So how come the super happy dev house this weekend is at Google? So we, we <laughs> well, because we rotate the location. We oh, have dev houses at Hacker Dojo, oh, yeah. but it's become, become part of a dev house culture to mix it up oh. and to also allow access to different people by, by having it in different places. And, and what's interesting is that um, dev house is now so large uh, that, that the dojo as it currently exists can't comfortably accommodate a full-size dev house. A full-size dev house is actually the biggest one we ever had. I think just capped 700 people. At the tech? Um, yeah, the, 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 the tech was, uh, was our biggest and only very narrowly seconded by the one that we had at Microsoft uh, headquarters also there in, in Mountain View. Um, because they've got two, like they probably have, I, I would guess it's like about 30,000 square feet uh, for us to use. Mm -hmm. And you can shovel a lot of people into 30,000 square feet, it turns out. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to, <clears throat> to share something about the impact that you might not even be aware of. But um, uh, we recently um, were partners on a proposal to the uh, Department of Education in Georgia. Um, uh, and one of the things that we're trying to do is create essentially a hacker space for kids to learn science, technology, engineering, and, and math. So we've actually asked them for an empty government building in Atlanta, Georgia, and the funding to create essentially a hacker space for kids. That is awesome. Super cool. So I, I hope we get the money. We'll see. <laughs> um, in addition to bringing a bunch of people under one roof and um, having a network there, what else do you do to um, help people discover what each other is doing? Is it just completely organic, or is there some some additional structural support there? Right now, it's completely organic. Um, what ends up happening is that people speak up for their needs, and then they make things happen. So, for instance, there is a mixer that happens on Friday nights at around... Uh, 5 p.m. or so, we have a happy hour, uh, and just people you know, who are regular members just go there and all get drunk together, and it's a very good way to, to get to know people pretty well. And that didn't happen because um, it's a formal structure process that, that, that we run. It happened because people said, hey, we should have get-togethers, and so get-togethers were born. And so most of what we try to do is get out of the way of that kind of organic structure very quickly forming. Um, and that, that's actually been a relatively successful uh, technique. Like we use that, for instance, for our governance. Um, we, we have these things called PBWs that stand for Polar Bear Wrestling um, that we have every uh, first Wednesday of the month where new policies are proposed and voted on uh, by the membership. And unless the directorship uh, vetoes them, they become dojo policies. So that's how new policies are born. So it's, it's all very uh, anarchic slash democratic, depending on how you want to see that. So there is structure, but it's or it, it emerges. Yes, yes, yes. The, the structure emerges organically. That's exactly the right way to see it. Yeah. So there are three or four people here who have been at Apple in the early days. And um, Mark was one of them. And Jim and Dan, all three of who asked the first three questions, and I'm wondering if, if you three guys have anything to share about some of the similarity of the vibes at Apple, like 20 years ago, to this, because I think this is fulfilling the same kind of emotional need that. I, and Dan, by the way, was Apple play number one. I think it's been close Zero. to 30. <laughs> 30. So, did any of you guys have any comments? Because this sounds like there's some of the shared energy thing. Well. For my part, the Friday Beer Bus, I was like the host of the Friday, Friday Beer Bus. I was at, the DJ at Apple. At Apple. Yeah. I was the DJ at Apple for 10, 15 years. So I kind of enabled that whole thing. And we get together and just, you know, that's where you meet up with people, you know, to discuss what you did that week, what you want to do next week. So. That's even John Scully used to come to the Beer Bus. I had yeah. my best conversations with senior management at the Beer Bus. Yeah. We're all of us uh, getting drunk, so that we didn't have to worry about what we we're asking management. So yeah, especially like uh, Bill Campbell. You know, Bill yeah. Campbell was there every That's single right. week. I remember visiting there when you were during the IBM era. Everybody at IBM was wearing the same color of suit and white shirt and tie, cookie cutter, and you were wearing Birkenstocks and sometimes sleeping overnight in your cubicles on little mattresses mm -hmm. and wearing and driving in on bicycles and. Um, the 
Monterey was fantastic, and it attracted young people much more than the IBM cookie cutter outfits, and that was one of your big strengths. It was so authentic. Yeah, and, and when amazing. IBM came to Apple uh, to impress Apple, they all wore T-shirts, and all, all the Apple people dressed up in <laughs> shirts and ties, you know, to meet to meet IBM. Freaky <laughs> 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 Friday. <laughs> And Darius, how about SGI? You were there at the beginning of that stuff. Was some of that yeah, in fact, going on? in fact, I was going to mention that it brings me back to both the early days of SGI and also the first company that I worked for out of college, which was Sage Computer, which the old timers might remember, um, and where I was a ninth employee, and and where the beer bust was just like the one time when all of us would pop our heads up from whatever we were doing mm -hmm. and get back together and talk about what are you up to? What are you up to? What are you up to? And 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 so that's just such a great uh, a great image of you know how focused people can be and yet how important that community is to be able to talk about what's going on and what are you doing and what are you working on. <coughs> yeah, it's great stuff. I, I wasn't actually at Apple quite as early as as, as some of you, so I missed some of that good stuff. I was actually at Texas Instruments at first, and they were trying to sell something called the 99.4 computer, which competed with the Apple II. Yeah. <laughs> when we saw the Apple II, and I, and I got to say is that at that time, Texas Instruments had more engineers with better training, formal training, uh, and better technology to build something. What they didn't have was that vision that comes from that kind of experience. When we saw that, I mean, I actually had a guy who worked for me who was selling buttons that said, I did not work on the 99.4 computer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he sold one to a reporter from Byte Magazine right after the West Coast Computer Fair when the Apple II was, <laughs> was shown, at which point I had to use a lot of my um, kind of uh, intellectual capital or whatever you call it, social capital, with my management to keep him from being fired. But eventually, I couldn't stand it anymore, and I came to Apple. And uh, I mean, I have to say, it really was. I mean, like I thought I'd died and gone to heaven for a while. Um, the first meeting I walked into, um, Alan Kay was there, Don Norman was there. Don Norman being the guru of, of user interface, who had been my professor when I was an undergraduate. Um, Gary Starkweather was there, who had these amazing stories about the invention of the laser printer at Xerox Park. Um, and probably the best best party ever at Apple was, um, I think it was at the um, uh, uh, aquarium in Monterey, if I remember right. Um, they rented out the whole aquarium. It was an R&D party. And, oh, it was. They had um, um, Tower of Power in one room. But if you didn't like that one, you could go into the next room, and they had Queen Ida. Mm -hmm. And if that didn't suit you, you could go in the next room, and they had Ella Fitzgerald, which was probably one of her last performances ever. And um, I mean, uh, besides it being a wonderful time, and probably extremely extravagant of John Louis Gasset to spend that much money on a on a party, um, it really did create an environment where people were just amazingly at the peak of their creativity. And, you know, and productivity, you know, probably in their lifetime. Well, you know, Jean-Louis Gasset brought uh, Cirque du Soleil to the United States for the first time at, uh, you know, San Francisco. <laughs> so it, it, there really yes. is something very special about it. You can just remember that, that people can't just sit at their computer and crank out code. There, there has to be that social view, and I, I, I think there's a really important idea here. So David, I've been to Hacker Dojo, some of you probably have as well. You know, it's rather surreal because wasn't that a stained glass factory, stained glass window factory yes. that went under? Yes. So there are these gorgeous stained glass windows everywhere with the light streaming and that are so elegant beyond belief, and then there are folding chairs and long old tables below. <laughs> um, so as we in this room might have a candidate for Hacker Dojo, could you give us sort of a basic profile, what would be a good person, a logical person who would be at home in Hacker Dojo to form a business, what would you like, or what do you usually see that, um, do they have an empty, is there a room they can go to to work privately, I believe so, I think you have a conference room somewhere, don't you, but the lots of open space though, people need to be comfortable at long tables, okay, yeah. all so of this. Mo mo so 100% of the space that we have at Hacker Dojo is communal, so when you become a member there, you don't get your desk, you don't get a spot in a cubicle, 
uh, you get the right to walk in the door whenever you want and sit, okay. sit down wherever there happens to be a free seat. Okay. We do have uh, three small cubbies that people can use to go work out of, um, but those are pretty much all on a first come first serve basis. We've got the third one on an experimental uh, system where you can reserve it for uh, an hour long chunk if you write your name and the given hour on the, on the on a little sheet of paper that we have hanging out front. Um, but yeah, I mean, people don't get offices there. Uh, as a result, what, what actually happens as part of the dojo ecosystem is that by, by the time your company grows to be about four or five regular employees, you're trying to make it a nine to five, you kind of need an office, in that sense, you, you outgrow the dojo. It's not a great place to like, hey, I'll move my 10 person startup into the dojo and we'll be working out of there. It's like, it's actually, that setup is probably not gonna work well, which is fine. Um, you'll probably want to continue to hang out at the Hacker Dojo maybe one day a week and like, you know, have, have events and hackathons there. Um, but yeah, we, we tend to find that um, startups that do well graduate out of, out of the dojo. And then finally, you've got that space next to all the other spaces for evening use. It, it's a room that, what, seats 80 people that you do events? Do you still have that around the corner from... Yeah, well, actually, um, it sounds like since you visited, uh, we've knocked a hole in the wall between uh, okay. those two spaces and put in a, a double door, so it's very easy to walk between okay. the two spaces. So what sort of events do you do in the evening? Are they open to the public? Um, who would go to an event there? Sure. So, I mean, we've, we've had um, random hacks of kindness there, uh, where the director of FEMA actually spoke uh, about the importance of uh, uh, internet tools in dis doing disaster recovery. Um, We've had uh, introduction to programming classes there. We've had um, ha workshops for uh, teenage boys and girls to, to learn how to program and get exposed to um, r really getting their hands on that. We've had I advanced machine learning courses that are there. Um, so it, it really uh, does spread the gamut. I would say there's a lot of popularity in our uh, introduction to uh, iOS programming and introduction to Android programming classes, because a lot of people like want to know, uh, you know, how to, how to program this because you can build really neat things and you can very quickly build single person companies that are doing pretty well. So yeah, I mean, uh, the, the schedule of events that we have is up on our website on hackerdojo.com. So if any of you want to check and 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 come to some of those. Pretty much all of our events, actually, all of our events are, are, are open to the public. You know, we ask that if you start coming regularly to the dojo, um, that, you know, you, you become a member, and membership is, we think, reasonably affordable. Yeah. How's your, obviously you're not trying to make money, but what's your financial model, what do you, membership costs, and how do you kind of work to? Sure, membership is $100 a month. Um, and that's pretty much the only expense. Um, you know, we, we, we don't try and nickel and dime people. Um, we've got a few companies that have done sponsorships. So Microsoft sponsored us uh, this year to the tune of about uh, $35,000. Um, that goes into building improvements. Um, we upgraded our internet from 8 megabit down, 2 megabit up ADSL, to 100 megabit synchronous fiber optic. Um, and our members were pretty pleased about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, about a about a year ago, we um, added HVAC, um, which made an enormous difference and paid for itself in about four months. Uh, since we had some very hot days and people said, "I want to work in a place that's cool," and we now had a cool place, so um, that worked out pretty well. But yeah, I mean, um, it's it's a hundred bucks a month, and that's that's the cost. How do you do the monitor management? When I've been there. There's sometimes people with like two laptops and four monitors, and it seems like organically monitors spring up all over the building. How does, how does that happen? Well, um, the rule about property at the dojo is that if it's unattended, it belongs to the dojo. So if you want to bring in four 30-inch monitors, you're absolutely welcome to do so. But if you leave them at the dojo, don't be very surprised if other people start using them. So th that very simple rule has actually uh, kept us from accumulating lots of cruft because you know, generally speaking, if people have nice things, they want to be the main person who's using those nice things. So uh, th that relatively limits things to stuff that you feel comfortable hauling in at the beginning of the day and then hauling out at the end of the day. 
certain other uh, hacker spaces uh, don't have that rule. And it's very easy to see when you walk into the hackerspace that most of what is in the hackerspace is not people working on things, but random crap that's been left behind. Um, and, and, and we've pushed pretty vigorously in our methodology to not become just random ass storage space. <laughs> Berkeley and the David Brower Center. Um, it's another one now in the in the Chronicle Building in San Francisco, and and it's a, it's a membership-based um, or organic, non non devoted shared office space with a few reservable um, conference rooms that fit like two people or three people, and you know, and, and, a, and a table, but to have a private conversation. Um, they hold events there in the evening. You know, there's like a little kind of a self self help little kitchen area over on the side where you can you know make your snacks and your tea and whatnot. And so you, you basically come and work side by side, but then also structures emerge to sort out what other people are doing and possibly get into collaborations. Then it sounds very similar. <laughs> Do you have a record of um, like how many startups has been funded? Since you are over? That's actually something that we do very poorly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> systematically record what kind of uh, inventions and innovations have, have happened there. Um, we do have a page on our wiki called Born Here, um, where we've got uh, something on the order of like 20, 30 projects, books, companies, etc., that have been launched at the dojo. Um, but it's a wild subset of, of uh, what's actually out there. Uh, I'm a mentor for Founders Institute. I don't know if you guys have, have heard of that, but it's a program to go and, and, and help people get off the ground with starting their own companies. Um, and when I last spoke to the Founders Institute, I had about uh, 50 different startups that I was speaking to, and I asked them if they had heard of the dojo, and all of them nodded, and I asked them to raise their hand if they had been to the dojo and worked out of the dojo, literally, Every hand in the audience went up, wow. um, so so it, it really does seem like it's it's kind of caught on culturally with the uh, startup community pretty pretty vigorously here. So. You mentioned North Carolina State, which has one of the most fantastic entrepreneur programs in in the world, and they have a hacker dojo type, you know, in that new facility they have there. One of the things that impressed me about that, I heard a lecture from the person running that program, and that is they have local business people who are retired or who have extra time, drop in occasionally and just act as mentors. They don't interrupt, but they're there. So, and it has really meant a lot to the students. Have you thought of doing anything informal like that where people who are experts, like some of the people in this room today, would certainly add a lot if they were to drop in? So, something, so, so pretty much all of our programs, other than uh, physically offering the space, um, emerge organically, and one of the things that's begun to emerge uh, organically that I'm a huge fan of is uh, professionals camping out and offering office hours. So we have an IP lawyer who, for instance, shows up about once every other week for about an hour and a half and broadcasts out to the list, hi, if you have any questions about patents, trademarks, copyright, if you think you've got something that's patentable and kind of want to talk it through with a real live IP attorney, um, I'm going to be here this time, why don't you come and like, we'll have a chat and I won't charge you anything for it, right? Um, and we, we've had a similar thing happen with a corporate lawyer. So, hey, you know, you've got three of you, you want to form a company, you're trying to figure out the mechanics around incorporation, how you put together your bylaws, how do you do, divvy up the equity, how do you do options packages. If you want a little bit of free time to get an initial run through from a you know, licensed lawyer, a barred lawyer, come, just drop by, let's have a chat. Right, and it's it's obviously great lead gen for these professionals, um, so that that works out that works out pretty well. So my, my hope is that that would continue and flourish. I mean, see more and more people uh, dropping by to to dispense advice in in the hope of forming a longer term professional relationship with some of these startups that are that are growing there. Yeah. So besides hosting software hackers, you've got a little, little bit of hardware hacking going on there too. You've got some lab space, and you've got some gear you want to. Tell. Because when you're by 
code, it has to run on something and sometimes it connects to other stuff. So they've got some of that going on there too. That's right. So I mean, I, I think that the, uh, the line between what is software and what is hardware has continued to be blurred. Um, I, I think a lot of software hackers are really interested in seeing their work incarnated. I mean, there's, there's something that's, that's really magical and beautiful about um, typing in a command line and knowing that you now have just fired up 100 Amazon instances, but you still can't see anything. And so it's like, it, it's, it's a very um, imaginative thrill, but it's not a, a tangible thrill, right? But when you reprogram a Roomba to go and chase after the red laser dot, uh, like a cat, uh, that, that's, that, that's got a sort of visceral thrill to it and a visceral cool factor that, um, that the command lines just have trouble capturing. So, you know, you see a lot of web programmers taking these uh, introduction to soldering classes, introduction to Arduino programming classes, which, are, which have gotten to be very popular. Um, there's now like an Android development kit. Uh, where, where you can pretty easily write peripherals that plug into an Android device. Um, this gets radically more exciting when you... Uh, when, uh, this is some of my former housemates worked for NASA Ames and managed to successfully get a, an Android uh, running in, in, in space. Um, and now coupled with the NanoSat program, that are that are now available, it means that for the on the order of you know tens of mid tens of thousands of dollars, um, you you can put together some peripherals, an Android device, uh, and, and and get the darn thing launched into space, and you've got your own like you know nanosat, um, and just the badass factor on that is pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> So they never underestimate, I mean, the, the Apple guys uh, understand this, like, in their DNA. Like, yeah, never underestimate the power of badassery, right? And, and the power of that to motivate people. So I think hardware has got that aspect uh, of, of, of cool that, that even, like, you know, iOS, for all its beauty, would, it still, like, it benefits a lot. From, from being in this shiny, shiny, shiny package, right? And, and Apple's nailed this, obviously, more than you know, pretty much any other company on the planet. But it, it's recognized at even a, a hacker basis that being able to incarnate the software in something cool is, is, is powerful. So how about test gear? Since nobody could own that, uh, monitors, you, you can buy a pretty inexpensive 20-inch monitor and bring it somewhere and drop it off for $100, $200. But I don't know, an oscilloscope costs more than a couple hundred dollars and people are less likely to want to drop it off. But I did notice you have some kind of interesting gear in there too. So is there any more restriction over some of that lab gear or is that kind of... If you're, if you're comfortable with your gear being used by the dojo, and you might have brought it explicitly for that purpose, then yeah, I mean, if it's large, then you probably want to clear it by the directors first, just because we're a little cautious about stuff that takes up a lot of floor space. So we've got, for instance, a 3D printer that's there at the dojo. Um, it's very, very cool stuff, but you really need you know, a fair amount of training in order to be able to operate it. And there are chemicals involved that, well, one of the bottles says in really large letters, this will kill you, um, <laughs> do not drink. But um, uh, but 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 that was something that was cool enough, and and we were convinced as the directors would be used enough that it was it was worthwhile to permit it being there. But yeah, I mean, if if there's equipment that you think would be uh, interesting for dojo members to use and to go and hack on, you know, we we love accepting those kinds of donations. So there's like uh, all kinds of like uh, Android dev gear, for instance, that just gets donated to us, um, that that oftentimes is just sitting out for for people to use and, and toy with. Hacker Dojo is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, not yet. Um, so this is actually th this part's a little bit thornier. Um, when we started out, you know, we incorporated as a as a, a California not-for-profit mutual benefit corporation uh, with an intent to file under 501c6, uh, which is the same sort of code as like chambers of commerce use, right? Clubs. So yeah, well, fraternal organizations are C7, but yeah, it's, it's it ball, ballpark that. Um, and, and the reason was that we, want, we wanted we, the majority of the financing to be coming from membership dues, right? And then we'd occasionally get people who were making donations who weren't affiliated. We'd occasionally get companies making donations that weren't affiliated, but that the principal revenue source and the principal benefit would be uh, to, from members and to members, right? 
Now, where things got complicated with the C6 filing is that it turns out there's pu punitive taxes for any money that you get that's not from members. So Microsoft's $35,000 donation would have been taxable under excise tax, and perversely, we would have ended up having to spend more in taxes as a nonprofit 501c6 than as a for-profit. So we said, screw this, this is silly. Um, and, and, and so we decided to drop our C6 application. And because of the benefit to members thing, it's hard to do a C3. There's the complication with C3. Of, yeah. And it, it, it turns out that we're probably going to be able to massage things to work out as a C3, uh, but member uh, dues are, are not going to be themselves tax deductible because they're receiving the full commercial value of that benefit. Um, so there's a little bit of tap dancing involved that we're still working through. That. Not tax deductible to them, correct. Because it's 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 not it's not a it's not a benefit free donation, right? So anyhow, there 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 was more complexity around that than I was really expecting, which is disappointing. Um, turns out that one of my friends um, uh, did his co-op incorporated in Canada, because Canadian tax law has got much better uh, structure for cooperatives. Uh, than the U.S. Ta the US tax code. Like, there's not a 501c that, that's a great fit for, for a cooperative that's run in this kind of a, a style. So it, it does need some massaging to look like a C3. But it seems inevitable at this point that that's the direction we'll go. What's interesting is since we're on a cash accounting basis uh, currently, uh, around December we, we Ford paid rent for the next six months, we Ford paid our electric bill for the next eight months, we, we Ford paid all our bills and at the end we, we said to the IRS, we, we didn't make any profit at all last year, you know. We just don't happen to have many 2011 expenses. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 501c3s are retroactive, so if you apply for it and they grant it, you can actually take backward like to, to the point where you started acting in the way that was compliant with what the ruling is. Right, which is since our inception, so. I've got a question. Yes. Yeah. Turn this thing on me. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I was thinking like a lot of the secret sauce seems like it's the shared value system, people, you know, sharing gear and, and expertise and just like energy, uh, enthusiasm on things. Um, when I was uh, talking to you and uh, with Katie, who couldn't make it tonight because um, she's sick, um, but um, she was, I think she mentioned that there was someone, you know, who saved some company $50,000 because they made something with a 3D printer and that sort of thing, right? And um, I'm wondering if there starts to become a conflict of interest when someone, you know, well, okay, maybe they could get 5000 for doing that or whatever, you know, and starts to use it to like start to use the equipment or whatever there is, right? That might be more of a shared value system to for their own more personal, you know, furtherment. So I, it just seems like there might be at some point a, a conflict there. I, I don't know. Just I'm curious. About the tragedy of the commons? Perhaps. No, I don't know. I, I'm just wondering if, if if that's just the culture sorts itself out there. People know each other enough, or is there? You know, people say, hey, you know, dude, like. You know, we're all trying to use this, or how, how is that, how these kind of things like that ever come up? Or so there's not a lot of competition for fixed resources like the fancier machines. Most of what people do at the dojo is intellectual property creation. You know, people are sitting down to write their book, to write their software, to build their project. Uh, and in that sense, it's it's not competitive because it doesn't take anything away from other people to be to be working on that. You know, other than the internet when it was slow. But now that we've got an infinite amount of bandwidth, that's not a problem anymore. Um, I would say that uh, in terms of the intellectual property side of things, if people are worried about being taken advantage of, um, it, it really comes, I, I think, down to the karma system, that if you become recognized as somebody who's regularly, let's say, saving companies $50,000 at a go, uh, companies are going to want to come to you and, <laughs> and and spend some real time with you and, and pay good money to be with you. So maybe like the first couple times, you know, you... You, you toss out a tip, or you you, you help somebody um, help somebody out. You you do it for free. If if they want to start using your time on a regular basis, you can strike up a you know professional contract with them. Um, also, just you know people. I, I I think this just sort of percolates into the larger uh, aspect of if you're out there and putting value out there and helping other people out, you're you're going to be recognized as such. You know, and and that. Gets, gets you dividends far greater than ensuring that every interaction that you have is monetized. And, and maybe that's a, a little hippy-dippy, 
but um, you know, I, I think it ends up proving out in terms of you know personal brand value and just how things work in the valley. Yeah, I think you know it's, uh, this uh, sharing conference a couple of weeks ago, and they're talking about just sharing economics and basically that in whether it's a car sharing system or a tool sharing system that now they're actually using you know I IT to actually monitor and then reputation systems and then the more you know good you are at taking care of people's stuff or you know better you are basically at sharing the more access you get and sort of this yeah. kind of interesting. It I actually mean, gets so, so much of Silicon Valley is, is predicated on on, on uh, this not being a zero sum game. You know, it's uh, if if I do well and write a really cool program, that doesn't mean that your your program doesn't get used or isn't worth anything, right? So we're we're not all here like fighting for the same slice of pie, because if you really believed that, um, well, I mean, you you believe that there is that, that growth is a myth, right? <laughs> and, well, you you sort of don't belong in Silicon Valley at that point, right? Mm -hmm. But but the, the, a lot of the growth that we've actually seen, and we have seen a huge amount of growth from Silicon Valley and from Silicon Valley companies has come from the, this, this sharing, this openness, these interactions. Um, and so to see it and to live it is to believe it, which then reflects on your own value systems. And you find yourself being out here a while, starting to share more openly with people and not looking for tit for tat for, with every interaction that you, you have with other people. You know, it's something that I, I grew up in Boston and it's very interesting to go back there and to, to talk with business people and to talk with entrepreneurs uh, who are out there on, on, on the East Coast. Um, a lot more, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible to generalize, but in general, uh, a, a, lot, a, a, a lot more of the, the, the business conversations are out there tend to be like, well, what can you do for me? You know, I can do this thing for you if you do this thing for me. And it's like, it's very transactional. Like. <laughs> That's perhaps, you know, um, but I think out here there's just this notion that, hey, other people who are above me and who are much further along than me helped me out, and so I'm going to help other people out, and so it's not even just a, I'm going to pay it into the karma system and hope that the karma system pays me back, um, but it's a pay it forward system. Like my parents did a good job taking care of me. I can't repay them for my childhood. So I'll try to take good care of my kids in turn. Um, and, and, and that, that spirit, I really haven't seen as pervasively incarnated as, as I, as I do in Silicon Valley. And it's part of the reason why the Valley is great, you know, cause we, we, we have people who are early employees at Apple who, instead of like living up in the hills and fuck you mansions, like come down and hang out with mortals. Right. And like, <laughs> and, 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 and tell us how it was and like help, help build the next great things. So coding is um, mentally messy, but it's not that physically messy. And I'm wondering if the, the dojo experience might be able to apply to the arts, because just as there's a blurring of the difference between hardware and software, I think there's also a blurring of the difference between art and science. And I'm wondering if some of the more maybe messier artistic kinds of things sometimes attempt to erupt in the dojo, but it's too messy to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Well, are you familiar with GAFTA? Okay, so, so the, the, this, this, this space between um, technology and arts is a gray area, and there is the gray area foundation uh, for, for, for the arts called GAFTA uh, that exists in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. And it, you, just from, from that little snippet you gave me, you would freaking love this place, right? Because <laughs> uh, it's, it's all about like you know, gorgeous data visualizations. Um, so it's like, is, is, is it a chart or is it art? I don't know, ask Tufty, right? Um, <laughs> and it, it, so I, I think th those kind of uh, mashups are, are welcome to the dojo. We actually had a dojo hack, hack art date. So we've got, um, we've got a big thing of Bruce Lee done in like post-it notes. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've, we've, got, we've got a button that has a, has a labeler above it that says like, uh, more cowbell. And then you press it, and then across the dojo on the ceiling, Bong! Like a, a cowbell sounds, right? So it's anytime you need more cowbell, you just press the button, right? Um, and so, so there, there's like a, a lot of this just spontaneous art that emerged uh, around the dojo that, that, that we've encouraged. And part of it is also intrinsic to the space. It literally used to be a, a custom glass working factory. So in really bizarre places, like up in a wall and like in a, in, a, in a strange place, there's like this gorgeous stained glass window. like. What? <laughs> you know, and the, the doors to the bathrooms are these like 
ornate like 1920s style art deco red and white glass pieces. It's like, it's a bathroom door? Like, <laughs> the woman who created that place used to be a member of us that used to come here. Oh, wow. Her last name was Len. Sake. Yeah, oh so uh, she was your, the prior occupant. And when I went to the dojo, I said, wait a minute, this is her space. I said, no, it's really different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's just like, so, so, so we definitely welcome um, art there. And we've, uh, we've started to do what we can to, to encourage uh, people to not feel uncomfortable with putting their fingerprints everywhere, right? Like, if you, like we, we've got a um, uh, giant couche. Uh, it's, it's like a 20-foot diameter high, hanging from the ceiling in, uh, in, in 140B that was made for a um, uh, kind of Burning Man on the Water uh, event that's called Ephemerile. Um, so, yeah, it's just like, yeah, because he, he, he assembled the, the, this friend of mine uh, from, from, from college, Matt Bell, that assembled this like 20-foot couche that he had like custom machined and like put together with like uh, water noodles. Um, <laughs> and he assembled it in my, in, 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 in my pool and then, um, you know, he took it out to this event, and it was a tremendous success there. It's very difficult to climb on. It's gorgeous, like, sitting in the water and all that. And he's like, uh, what do you think we could do this, with this? And I said, you should hang it up in the Hacker Dojo. So, so you know, there it is. You walk in, and it's like this just giant, like, koosh hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, so so we, we, we love to encourage art. You know, if there's more ways that we can encourage art, that'd be great. There's connections between coding and art that, that people don't realize. Like, the first punch card computer systems came from automated weaving machines. You know, there, there's, there, there's, there's, there's this history of, of, of the making of the tactile and the production of art um, with, with, with computers. It goes way back when. Like, was it? Uh, I, Ivan Sutherland, like the inventor of like modern 3D graphics, you know, was really pushing computer technology for, for the, for the, for largely for the, for the creation of art and drafting and, like, and, and all that, right? Um, yeah, so I mean, if there's other things that we can do to encourage it, that'd be great, but you should go and visit GAFTA for sure. So, yeah. so how about music? Now that you've become a pretty large space and it's somewhat partitionable, uh, music tends to leak around the edges because it's noisy. <laughs> But I think you actually have enough space that there could conceivably be a space within your space where people can make noise without preventing people from hacking. And uh, I would donate some music gear to such a space because I have a ton of music gear. And would it be cool for you guys to have like musicians show up that like jammed in the space? I, I think it would be great. Um, you know, I donate my uh, Technics 1200 Mark II turntables like to the space. <laughs> Um, so people could learn to, to, to spin and beat match, you know, because that's like a really interesting, phys it's an interesting thing, particularly, uh, you know, for, for folks who uh, were, were born in, let's say, the, 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 the late 80s or even early 90s and who have only ever experienced MP3 players, um, to, to have a, a record, like the sound is on this and, it, and you have a needle and you push the needle, oh my God, like the needle is, is, is wiggling and that's the sound, like <laughs> and it's, just, it's, it's, it's a remarkably uh, tactile experience, right? So it's, it's, it's neat to have that there and I, I think people really do uh, appreciate there being music and, 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 and culture uh, that's there. I, I think there is a delicate balance with how do, you, how do you have that there and be expressive without interrupting people who are really like trying to focus and, 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 and are in the zone. Headphones, yeah, headphones is, is a big part of it, awesome. definitely. Yeah, yeah. But I think it'd be a fun experiment to run. So it's like if, if you want to get a bunch of musicians to go and you know, show up there and like... I'll sign up. Yeah, that could be, that could be good fun. <laughs> goggles. Hmm? Your, your swim goggles. Yes, swim goggles. <laughs> so, how do you manage it with PBWiki and Hacker Dojo? Like, how, what's your schedule? Like, how do you? How much time does it take for you? You talked about some of these directors that are there. So. Yep. So, um, part of what lets the dojo run well with no paid staff, really. Uh, is that it, it, we, we've deliberately set things up uh, around a more organic than a structured schedule, which means that the management can be very hands-off. It's deliberately that way. So we try and set expectations that, like, you know, no, we're, we're, we're not going to be there all the time uh, making sure that every event runs well um, or, or anything like that, right? So, um, you know, in terms of my schedule, I, I spend probably about... Uh, 
10 hours a month working on dojo stuff, and most of that is actually uh, virtual. So, you know, resolving legal things, member conflicts, um, changes in policies, you know, just stuff like that. So it's, uh, the intent is for it to be as self-running an organization as possible, mm -hmm. that the community can mature to the point where it, it's uh, capable and uh, feels empowered to, to, to resolve its own issues well, and that it should be a very rare thing that they need to come to the directors to go and, and, and settle something, right? That, that we become more like the arbiters of, of last resort when, when you guys can't figure things out. And that's maybe where some of your brevity comes from. This guy's got a very, well, most, most, highest, most condensed communicator I've ever met. You wouldn't think so from tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get him in digital form. Twitter is helpful. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I think he sent you a big email and you answered, yep. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's <laughs> so, uh, for the super happy dev house, how much of it? Uh, there's a sharing s s portion. Like, I mean, people people give a pitch or uh, say what they are looking for help with, right? Because yeah, that, so that was pretty much the whole thing at the Homebrew Computer Club, right? So, so, so Lee Felsenstein has actually become yes. uh, a part of Super Happy Dev House. What's now. his title? Is he had a, he had like a, a title somewhere? Like Eminence Grease or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Lee likes to give himself interesting titles. Um, so, so Lee's a big fan of something that he calls random access, where random people access. stand up and say for 30 seconds uh, what they're interested in and who they'd like to meet. Mm -hmm. right. um, and just you pass the mic around until you're all done with that, and then you go meet with the people who sounded interesting to you to meet. And so we've run random access at a couple different dev houses. One of the things that we try to do, in addition to rotating location, is also to uh, continue to experiment with what does it mean to be a dev house, right? And, and to try different things. Uh, some of the things end up very successful, uh, like lightning talks, where people give five-minute um, applied technology lectures. Um, and then that's actually been remarkably successful. And some of them not so well, where we had this one dev house that was um, all weekend long and done as a coding tournament. Uh, in the France Telecom offices in South San Francisco, and that didn't work out so well. So it's like we, we, we try to keep it fresh by continuing to uh, I experiment with the model. But, um, but lightning talks are very cool uh, because you basically get, um, you get to have an audience of a room full of technologists, and the goal for a lightning talk is to produce a actionable piece of knowledge in the head of the audience within a five-minute time period. So to explain a, a technology platform they can use, give a demonstration of why it's interesting and why it's cool, and have there be enough in terms of the resources and links that are gi given and so forth that somebody, after watching the talk, could say, like, wow, now I know how to do boom, right? They could turn around, open up their laptop, and start actually building something differently as a result. Um, so th th that's been a tremendous success. Sometimes if we have them at the end of a dev house, we'll have people present uh, s something that you built in the course of that dev house. And, and, and such is the pace of software development these days that you, know, you can show up to one of these things, have an idea, register the domain name, build it out, get users, get user feedback, start iterating on it, and then it's time to go home. Because <laughs> so the, 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 the pace is really one of the more remarkable things about being in the 21st century having these kinds of gatherings. That's actually something that attracted Lee was, Lee said, we'd meet every two weeks and we'd discuss what had changed in, in the two weeks. Now at, at these, at the dev houses, um, we, we have announcements at the end of the dev house about how the tech space is different from, from when, uh, when it began, right? <laughs> uh, the one that I went to at the tech, uh, Ted Nelson was a mm -hmm. featured speaker. Now that wasn't a five minute lightning talk, I don't think. No, so that's, that's a good example that of, that of was an experiment. That we, uh, <laughs> that we you know, when I think of Mountain View, I think of that lovely Castro Strait and its inexpensive food. The rents are cheaper than Palo Alto. Things are happening at Fenwick and West and Shoreline and Michaels and that windsurfing area in the wetlands, all within a few minutes' drive oh. or a bicycle drive. 
Did you choose Mountain View in that area specifically because it had such a perfect microcosm uh, geographical area? Do most of the people at Hacker Jojo live within 20 miles? So they, they benefit from that very special area of Silicon Valley where so much is happening. So when, when we were first looking at uh, where do we open our first Hacker Dojo, uh, we, we put out a bunch of surveys. And one of the things that we noticed was that uh, while people definitely did want uh, a dojo in San Francisco, there were a lot of other resources and interesting, slightly semi-fungible resources that were available I in the city. Um, I, I know your opinions about launching something in San Francisco. Um, and in the Mid-Peninsula, there wasn't very much either. Um, but, but just from a sheer population density perspective, San Jose, San Jose has more than twice as many people living in it as San Francisco. You wouldn't really think so, just because it's called the San Francisco Bay Area, but San Francisco itself has fewer than a million uh, inhabitants, which is like, uh, kind of shocking. And San Jose, I believe, is, is more than two. Um, <clears throat> no? It's slightly over. Slightly over one, but... At, 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 but that's at, only San Jose, and then you got all the other yeah. cities. The sure. Border, right? Surrounded by suburbs. Yeah. So that's uh, perhaps you can excuse my math with calling it Santa Clara County. Um, <laughs> but um, there, there, there was an absolute uh, deficit of, of, of anything meaningful down there, other than you have a plug-and-play tech center in Sunnyvale, um, but, but in terms of a hacker space, you had the second floor of Red Rock Cafe on Castro Street, um, which is amazing. Super props to, to, to that place. But that was pretty much it. Um, so we saw a lot of demand from people who were working at Google, who were working at NASA Ames, and said, we have nothing down here. The people in SF have all these like cool different places, and they've got a bunch of options. Um, and we just, we're starving for something. So uh, I originally wanted to open it up in the Mid-Peninsula, but I saw how much incredible demand there was down in Mountain View, how many people wanted to go there. Um, we originally were looking for a place that was actually on Castro, but the rent was uh, a little too high for us. So, so we picked the place that we did. What's really interesting to watch that's happened in the last year is now it's not a coincidence, the radius of people who mm -hmm. go to the dojo. We've, we've gotten people relocating um, to live nearby the dojo. So uh, Wisman Station, which is uh, just across Alma, um, is starting to get uh, a whole bunch of uh, people moving in there so that they can just bike on over to the dojo, they can walk on over to the dojo. I, I would say an, an interesting percentage of the regulars of the dojo um, have changed where they live to have easy access to the dojo. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to reach, it, and, and then startups are forming that come out of the dojo and they want office space nearby so they can still drop by the dojo. So now the employees that they're hiring, they're, they're pulling down to Mountain View. So it's creating like this black hole of like, <laughs> of, of tech talent down there in Mountain View. Sounds like you've saved it. Uh, so I wonder if you could uh, say a little more about PBWiki. Um, uh, is there like a premium? It, it's uh, there's like like an entry level that's free, or you could pay to get a better. And you sell service. And how many of your customers or how many of your users are corporate? That want sure. To pay for it. Sure. Uh, so we let individuals and um, some very small nonprofits uh, use our service for free. Uh, at the point that you're using it at a company, we charge companies $20 per employee per month who are using the service. Um, we've got about 4 million people a month who, who use our service, wow. um, uh, accessing about a million and a half different groups. Um, we've got about, uh, like, depending on how you count, about like 5,000 different customers uh, representing several hundred thousand paid seats. So our, our dev base is all out here, um, you know, working out of uh, San Mateo in the, in the Siebel building, um, the, the old Siebel building, Crossroads at 92 and 101. Um, and we've got a, a sales team that's out in Nashua, New Hampshire. And um, yeah, that's trucking along. Successful. Depends on uh, which quarter you're asking me. Uh, did I agree to that or not? But <laughs> Are you, uh, did you ever take angel funding, VC funding, and what was your ramp like with PBWiki? So I launched it in mid-2005, and at the time I was full-time on my own ideas with friends and family financing and Visa, and um, <laughs> then uh, PBWiki started taking off, and 
In the fall of 2006, I took financing from an angel group for about $350,000. It's mildly catastrophic and traumatizing. And um, <laughs> then immediately thereafter, the wiki space started really heating up. Uh, so we got a whole bunch of interest from VCs, and we didn't need the money because we had just taken this terrible angel financing round. Um, and I was uh, advised, well, it turns out that that's absolutely the best time to take money is when you really don't need it. Um, so we ended up getting financing from uh, more David Al Ventures. Um, and then we got a supplementary round from them uh, a, a few years later. So that's uh, the route that we've gone. So most of the revenues that we've gotten are, uh, so most of the money that we uh, have is come from uh, users, but um, you know, investment has helped us uh, scale up to the opportunity. And David's published a really nice document about stock options and that sort of thing that I've kind of read through and I've, I've learned a lot. <laughs> A lot of hands-on stuff there. Is it based like, on your personal experiences, the stock options? Oh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, I had to learn pretty much everything about business on the job because I didn't have a business degree, not that that undergrad means anything more than partying, uh, or, or an MBA, but ditto for that, I guess. Um, and so I, 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 I didn't come with any formal training, so I, I kind of wanted to write a document that I wish I could have handed myself when starting out about um, this is really what stock and options are. These are things that seem like really good ideas that smarter people than you thought were good ideas and turned out to be really burned very badly by. Uh, and that these are things that you couldn't possibly naturally know about, like an 83B election, that are really good ideas and the consequences of doing those and just kind of walking uh, an, an intelligent layperson uh, through this, you know, that, okay, you've heard stock, you think you know what stock is because, you know, you, you turn on the news and, like, Apple stock is up, you know, what does that really mean? What's actually going on? What are options? What does that really mean? Like, let's break down all of this. Um, and I, I did it in about a 15-page document that I wrote on a flight to London. Um, and uh, it's gotten about 100,000 views, so it's it's done pretty well. So if, if you uh, look for it on, on Scribd, um, or an, an introduction to stock and options. Um, just a Google search for Scribd intro stock and options. It should pretty much be the first Google hit. It's, um, it's just it's uh, free um, free to read there. There's a link to the Kindle edition for two ninety nine. I'm experimenting with monetization. <laughs> um, you spoke so much about sharing the learning. Um, is there any activity that involves kids, school kids, or high school kids to come build learn? We want more. We really want more. You know, we've, we, 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 we had an event there that was very successful called Hack the Future uh, that, 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 that was almost titled uh, Future Happy Dev House, um, <laughs> where, where we're trying to get more teenage, you know, girls, teenage boys um, to be coming to the dojo, to be getting started in programming, um, and, and, and to get hands-on with building things, because we think that's tremendously important. Um, yeah, I, I think parental support is is really key. Like, if you can get mom or dad or mom and dad to like show up and bring their kids and like, hey, we're going to learn Python today. Like, um, that's really great. Um, we haven't done a great job at it. Like, you walk into the dojo and you'll see everything from um, like mid twenties all the way up to like you know mid sixties. There, um, we've we've got a we've got a fairly broad range. But we, we don't have enough, uh, the teenagers, we don't have enough of like the nine and 10 year olds. Um, and we'd love to find a way to make it even more inviting to, to those communities. There are a few things happening in that area, but not enough. If anyone in this room had a child age five right now starting in school in this area, all the way through graduate school, chances of having any coursework in business would be practically nil. Business has practically left all the high schools in the area, but uh, Monte Vista High School has a very strong program and we have an entrepreneur boot camp set up for August 8th through 12th for incoming freshmen. 139 kids have already signed up and we're set to go for our first uh, entrepreneur boot camp for that week. We'll have them turn out a product at the end of the weekend. So we need more of this. You're absolutely right. There's tremendous demand. Parents signed up one night, 139, and we closed it off right then. So there's really a tremendous need, and maybe Hacker Dojo could take a role in that at some point or other, with help from others. Yeah, my fantasy is that we get some really passionate parent uh, who's a member of the dojo who says, you know what, this needs to happen. They stand up, they make the event happen. That's basically how uh, Hack the Future happened, 
and you know they, they were they were shocked by how much support they got from the community because they were worried about like you know hey there's all these people working on like these serious hardcore pro projects like they're writing their own operating systems they're doing their their own like crazy tech projects like are they going to really want teenagers around like who are just figuring out technology for the first time the answer across the board was oh my god yes like you know we want to support that because that's where we started and we would have loved to find out about a place like Hacker Dojo when we were in high school. That'd be so cool. <laughs> well, there are two clubs that meet in the area for high school students. One is Future Business Leaders of America. It's been around since 1941, and they have international business plan competitions. And the other is the DECA chapter, Sales and Marketing, and they have international competitions. Lana Vista's been in the top five, for example. There are liaison to our group uh, in the past years. Um, they just got back from Orlando last week. So there are things happening in these school clubs, but not very many of them, and they come and go based on the teacher's availability. But they're uh, but being Silicon Valley, our, our teams win internationally almost all the time. Which school is that? Setting. Monta Vista, Homestead. It's the Fremont uh, Union High School District primarily, a little bit in the East Bay. Uh, Harker is doing some things, Valley Christian a little bit, not so much in our a couple of homeschool. But we, we could probably work with Hacker Dojo um, so kids could see an actual facility such as yours on a field trip, which would be very wonderful. That'd be awesome. Maybe there was an activity that went on last year in San Francisco that was made for 15 to 19 year olds and you had to be 15 to 19 to attend it. And that was a huge success. They put on their own one day event and nobody could get in if they weren't between the ages of 15 and 19. And it was wonderful. We need more of that sort of thing too. <laughs> you know, I think Maker Faire helps that a lot. Oh, Maker Faire is fabulous. Yeah. yeah. So SBI also has an educational initiative that we kicked up a few months ago, which right now is being called Phone Physics, and it's to try to teach people who are, say, preschool, five years old, four years old, how to program iPhones to increase their innovation resilience, because it's come to our attention that most creative people get told no an awful lot, and we figured if we can give them an early innovation experience, it would increase their resilience and be like inoculating them with innovation DNA so that when adults said, you can't do that, they go, oh, sorry, I already did it. <laughs> and, and we actually have a working group called Phone Physics that we have our next meeting next Tuesday from 4 to 7. It's on our website. So we, we've got a bunch of coders who have come together. Oliver helped us get a grant from Wells Fargo Bank for a few thousand dollars. So we are actually working on how to head off the school system wow. by... Uh, teaching really young people how to be innovation resilient. It's fabulous. And maybe we should try to figure out a way to connect to you guys. Yeah. yeah. Have some events at Hacker Dojo. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. Co-brand. Love it. So I'm also a mentor for 20 under 20. So I've been uh, passion. Oh, you are the Peter Thiel group? Yes, that's right. Oh, wow. It's 24 now. Remember, you couldn't avoid the other four. So it's <laughs> <laughs> the program is still called 20 under 20. But, yeah. So has everybody had enough of that? I mean, it could go on indefinitely, but you might want to take a breath. <laughs> so thank you. That, that was really great. And you've done a you know, wonderful thing, yeah. pushing this thing forward. And why, it's a really generative situation. It's kind of taken on its own legs and its own life. And it's awesome. So thank you.